Him, we praise Him. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet for us, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you. And with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh here for Masjid al-Furqan uh, in my native Caribbean island of Trinidad. On this, the 29th day, the month of Jumadi al-Ula. We, we in Trinidad will look for the moon tonight. And if the moon is not seen, then... Uh, the month of Jamadi Al-Ula will last for one more day, inshallah. We continue today. I was hoping to complete uh, methodology last, the last class, but we have to, one last part today to complete it. And it is uh, by far the most important part methodology for the study of the Quran in Akhiru Zaman. And uh, we recall that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam asked us to recite the first ten ayat or verses of Surah Al-Kaf for protection from the fitna of the child. And in another hadith, the plus three ayah. So that there is a connection between Surah al and al masih al Dajjal. Secondly, that it is this Surah of the Quran which introduces the subject of Gog and Magog, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And these are the two most important actors in the world. <coughs> Al-Masih al-Dajjal and Ya'juj and Ma'juj or Gog and Magog. And so Surah Al-Kahf is the most important Surah of the Quran teaching us Akhiru Zaman or the end time. But this is not new to you. You already know this. What is important is that there is in Surah al kaf an encounter between Musa alayhi salam and someone who is described as the most learned of all men indicating, because this is Surah al kaf that this is the most learned of all men in Akhiru Zaman, or the end time. And uh, he is given the name, the nickname, Khidr, or Green. And of course, our Prophet said, Allah's blessing be upon him, that he got this name, uh, Mr. Green, because he came to a land which was barren, nothing growing. And he sat down on that land and everything came out lusciously green. And so he is someone whose knowledge is such. His knowledge is not mechanical. He doesn't get knowledge from a box which is sealed and simply transferred from one generation to another. Rather, his knowledge is such that it's like raindrops falling from the sky. And when these raindrops fall in the heart, they revive the heart. It's new knowledge. It's knowledge like a fresh breeze that revives us. This is Khidr alayhi salam. And in the encounter of Musa, alayhi salam and khidr alayhi salam we have 
critically important information and guidance concerning the methodology for the pursuit of knowledge and the study of the Quran, and also the model of scholarship, the only model of scholarship which can penetrate the world, penetrate reality in the end time. All the rest of mankind would be whistling in the wind. It doesn't matter who you are and what PhD you have. You'll be whistling in the wind if you are pursuing knowledge with traditional scholarship. What is this scholarship? This model of scholarship of Khidr alayhi salam, which is a model of scholarship for Akhirul Zaman. We have been teaching this subject for 20, 25 years now, but they would not listen to us. They would not listen. So what can we do to teach, of course, those who want to learn? And the rest, what can we do? The model of scholarship of Akhirul Zaman is one which must take cognizance of the fact that appearance and reality would not be the same in the end time. Things are not going to be what they appear to be. They appear to be something, but the reality is something else. And this is because our prophet said, Allah's blessing be upon him. The Dajjal comes with two things. But you never hear this from the member. Nobody talks about this from the member. Dajjal comes with two things. He comes with a river and with a fire. But his river is a fire. And his fire is the cool waters of a river said our prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him. Whoever falls in his river will have his load of sins increased. And whoever falls in his fire will have his load of sins decreased, indicating that the Dajjal will take the road to hell and make it look like the road to heaven. He's doing that every night on television. And the genre will take the road to heaven and make it look like the road to hell. And one of the most important instruments he has for taking the road to heaven and making it look like the road to hell is the weapon of riba. In true riba, he causes the people to become so poor and destitute they are embraced by a new slavery. We don't have the scholars anymore who are able to penetrate this subject. That riba is bringing a new slavery, destitution to the world. But if you had a man like Malcolm X, he never went to al Azhar University. Malcolm could not even recite the Quran in Arabic. And yet one Malcolm is worth a thousand graduates of al Azhar University because Malcolm had insight. And we just got the wonderful news from Africa. One leader in the world, Africa, Rwanda. And we got the news that the president of Rwanda, Rwanda is saying, if they can take paper and print it and make money, and we can't do it with our paper, but we have to repay them with their paper, we pay our, our resources, our wealth, our mineral resources, our, our products, our money, everything we will become eventually poor and destitute. They will become rich. 
because they're getting everything free. He said, this is a new slavery. This is a new colonization. And the president of Rwanda is correct. Why is it that this kind of scholarship, this kind of insight from an African country, Rwanda, and we can't get it from Saudi Arabia, we can't get it from Pakistan, we can't get it from Turkey, we can't get it from Egypt, but Rwanda is telling us that this paper money is the road to slavery, yes. So this is one of the most dangerous weapons he has when he takes the road to heaven and makes it look like the road to hell, a weapon of Riva. And when we come to the encounter between Musa al-Islam and Khidr, we see this same thing at work, that appearance and reality are different from each other. And conventional scholarship cannot penetrate the reality of things. But the scholarship of Khidr Islam succeeds in penetrating and explaining. And this is our predicament today, that our world of Islamic scholarship, why they have knowledge that is inside of the box. And that knowledge, of course, is of value. The world of Islamic scholarship today has failed and failed miserably in penetrating the reality of the world today and in saving our people from descending into greater and greater slavery and destitution. You will have to answer to Allah for that. Khidr alayhi salam differs from conventional scholarship because Allah says that he gets knowledge directly from Allah, number one. And we gave him knowledge directly from ourselves. And secondly, that the hallmark of his personality is constant, constant, constant kindness. He's constantly kind. Rahma is kind. And then Surah Al Kaf tells us that you will find this most learned of all men, the man who is the model of scholarship in Akira's a man. Where will you find him? You will find him at a place called Majma'ul Bahrain, the place where the two oceans meet. And this is not the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, no. This is an ayah mutasha biha, or a verse which has to be interpreted. And uh, the famous commentator of the Quran, Imam Baidawi, he gave the interpretation. He says, this is ilm al and ilm al -Bahir. This is external knowledge and internal knowledge. So the world of the, the location of Majma al Bahrain is the place where the ocean of externally acquired knowledge and the ocean of internally received knowledge, these two oceans come together and are harmoniously integrated into a whole. It is that scholarship you need to be able to penetrate the ayat mutashabihat of the Quran and to be able to recognize what is the Quran teaching us about Akhir. It's my good fortune, Allah's kindness to me. Born in the Caribbean island of Trinidad, that I was blessed to become the student of precisely such a scholar. Was 
embodiment Majma'ul Bahrain the place where they worship Indian In the encounter of Musa with Khidr alayhi salam in Surah al kaf the Quran has delivered crucially important information concerning methodology of study in the pursuit of knowledge in the end time. Appearance and reality will differ from each other in many things in the end time. And proper scholarship requires a scholar to be able to distinguish between the outward form and the inner reality of things. This also includes being able to recognize ayat mutashabihat and to interpret them. Conventional scholarship, symbolized by Musa al-Islam, is incapable of recognizing the reality of the three events. The boat, the boy, and the wall. But the scholarship of Khidr alayhi salam which is empowered with knowledge received internally from Allah Most High, successfully interprets all three events. The, full, the surah informed us that Khidr can be found at Majma'ul Bahrain, the place where the two oceans meet. And as we said before, the two oceans are the ocean of knowledge externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge internally received. These two oceans of knowledge have to be harmoniously integrated to make an organic whole. This is the only model of scholarship which can penetrate and understand the reality of the world in the end time. Now, how can you acquire knowledge or receive knowledge internally? Answer, internal knowledge comes to the heart. <laughs> and if the heart is without any nur, the heart cannot receive knowledge. So only when the heart has nur, nur means light, the heart receive knowledge. So how do we get nur or light in the heart? Answer. Allah gives his nur to whomsoever Allah chooses to give. So Allah will check the heart and to see whether this heart has sincerity in it whether this heart has purity in it, whether this heart has kindness in it, and most important, whether this heart has faith in it. There are those who say, no, 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 I can't stand up for the truth. They're going to say I'm a terrorist. No, I can't speak like that. My business will collapse. No, no, no. If I speak like that, they will put my name on a no-fly list. <laughs> no, no. If I speak like this, I might lose my job. I won't get a promotion. Do you think Malcolm X would speak in that stupid way? No. Malcolm would stand up for the truth regardless of the price he had to pay. That's why we honor Malcolm so much and we don't have the same honor to give to these scholars who have graduated and yet have no backbone. So Allah will look at the heart. Be conscious of the fact that Allah hovers between a man and his heart. Allah is looking at the heart. He doesn't look at your bed. <laughs> he doesn't look at your clothes. He looks at your heart. And if the heart has sincerity, 
it has kindness, it has faith in truth, then Allah can choose to give no to that heart. And only when there is no in that heart will, will, will you have something called basar. Basar is insight. To be able to see what others cannot see. Like, for example, let's pause for a moment to look at what is happening around us in the world today. That, uh, you know, eschatology is that branch of knowledge who studies the end time. And we know that the most important event still remaining to occur in history is the return of the true Messiah, Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary. Allah's blessing be upon them both. And we know that when Jesus returns, that he is, um, he's coming back to rule the world. Not just downtown Chicago. And we know that when he comes back, he will rule the world from Jerusalem. Everything, everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. But our prophet also said, alayhi salatu salam, that before Jesus returns, there's someone who has been created by Allah and who wants to impersonate him. And he is known as al So he wants to rule the world as well. And he wants to rule the world from Jerusalem. And as we mentioned in the previous class, Allah says in Surah Al-Mursalat, he gave us the warning. In Taliku, ila zillin zi salasi shu'ab. Proceed now to a shadow which will unfold in three parts. And we said that that shadow is the jal. And the three parts is the trademark of the jal. That everything connected with him has three and falls in three parts. And we came to the conclusion, and this is only Islamic eschatology is saying this at this time. You cannot hear this from Christian eschatology, nor from Jewish eschatology, no Hindu, no Buddhist eschatology, only Islamic eschatology. That this virus, with which we are now being enveloped all around the world, and people are dying, this is just the first drizzle, the first light shower. We can anticipate that this virus and the vaccine have come to facilitate the job, that he'll eventually be able to rule the world from Jerusalem. We can see that. And that the first part of the shadow is giving us this light shower, light shower, this drizzle, in which only a few people are dying. But we can anticipate that there are Heavy showers of rain coming. When you can't have a container to keep the bodies, there will be so many people dying. The people, the governments will not allow you to have salat or janaza, will not allow you to bury. No, 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 it will be too many people dying. They might even decide to burn all bodies. You can't complain because you're dead. And when we thought this was the worst of it all, we are saying in Islamic eschatology that the, after the heavy showers, there will be thunder showers, third part of the virus. And it is after the thunder showers with millions and millions who, be, who have died because of the virus. And the world has shrunk and become considerably smaller. Only then would a Pax Judaica be able to replace a Pax Americana in the same way that a Pax Americana replaced the Pax Britannica, the three parts. Here is an example of that insight of Basar. 
that comes from the scholarship of Khidr alayhi salam. And this is perhaps the most important part of our class on methodology for the study of the Quran in Akhirul Zaman. Remember, Wala yamassuhu illa al mutahharun. La yamassuhu illa al mutahharun. You can't even scratch this Quran. Allah is saying in Surah Al Waqiyah, you cannot even scratch this Quran for penetrating it. But penetrating its knowledge, what it has to offer to explain the world today, unless and until you are pure. The meaning the heart must be sincere in its attachment to truth. Now then, I believe um, if I'm wrong, please correct me that I've already completed this uh, portion. Never study any words of the Quran in isolation. Okay, so now we've completed uh, our study on methodology and uh, we are now ready to begin our class on the eschatological Quran. We took three classes to prepare ourselves for the verses of the Quran which pertain to Akhiru Zaman. This is the eschatological and when we do that, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam has prepared us for eschatology. Because his is the most powerful voice in history. We have prophesied that Jesus, the true Messiah, alayhi salam, one day return to the world. This is the most important event remaining to occur in history. If this is what our prophet has said, and if the Quran says that it has come to explain all things, is it possible that the Quran can be silent? On the return of Nabi Salisa. Remember that Ayat Mutashabihat are verses which have to be interpreted in order to be understood. But when you make an interpretation, no one can confirm that it is correct except Allah. So whenever you make an interpretation, you have to say, what do you have to say? Allah knows best. Allah knows best. But we need something solid in the Quran on the return of Jesus. Can the Quran be silent on this on the return of Jesus? And now we come to what we call the foundation verse of Islamic eschatology. The most important verse in the whole Quran on Islamic eschatology. What is that verse? The Christian and the Jew both have the identical belief that Allah Most High would send someone known as Al Masih, Messiah. <laughs> and He will send them to Banu Israel. He send him to Banu Israel, the Israelite people. And that He, the Messiah, would eventually rule the world from Jerusalem, with the rule with which history would end. It is in this sense, namely, 
that with his rule, history would end. The Judeo-Christian eschatology recognized that the Messiah would rule the world eternally. Good. Christian eschatology recognizes that the Messiah came in the person of Jesus, the son of the Virgin Maria, alayhi salam. Christian eschatology tells us that he departed from this world without ruling the world, but that he will return to the world one day. And it will be at that time of his miraculous return that he will rule the world from holy Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal. This is Christian eschatology. The Jew, on the other hand, not only rejected the claim of Jesus to be the Messiah, but he continues to do so to this day. And hence, Jewish eschatology is firmly located in the belief that history would end when someone else, other than Jesus, would come to the world as an end time ruler and would declare from the holy state of Israel in Jerusalem, he is the Messiah. Christian eschatology has also revealed information about that false Messiah known as the Antichrist, who would emerge in the world in the end time and who would seek to so impersonate the true Messiah as to deceive the Jews into believing that he is the true Messiah. Good. What does the Quran say? Bosnia. They don't drink Nescafe. No, no. The Bosnians give me real coffee. The, esch the eschatological Quran confirms the Christian belief, confirms the Christian belief in Jesus as the Messiah. The Quran confirms the Christian belief that the Messiah came to this world. That the Messiah departed from this world when Allah Most High raised him to himself. At that time, when by divine plan, all those who were present saw him crucified. And that he would one day return to the world miraculously, so to rule the world from a holy state, a Khilafah state in Jerusalem. Because the Quran says they saw him crucified, but appearance and reality were different. No, he was not killed. No, he was not crucified. But Allah made it appear. Should be alone appear like that. Islamic eschatology also confirms the Christian belief. In the end time emergence of Dajjal, the false messiah or antichrist, who would so impersonate the true messiah that the Jews would be deceived and would accept him as the true messiah. It would be at that time when Dajjal declares himself in Jerusalem to be the messiah that Allah would then send Jesus back to this world. So, Jesus cannot come back until the Jal has completed his mission. Only when the Jal has completed his mission, only then can Jesus be sent back. This is Islamic eschatology, eschatology teaching the subject that the Christians don't appear, don't appear to understand. His miraculous return, the Quran is saying, constitute 
the sign of all signs of the last hour. The miraculous return of the true Messiah to this world. 2,000 years or more after he left would be the sign of all signs of the last hour. So we now commence with the verse of the Quran which declared plainly, clearly, so this is Ayah Muhkama. This is not Ayah Mutashabiha. Allah is saying it plainly, Allah is saying it clearly and categorically that Jesus is the sign of the last hour. It must be recognized as the very foundation verse of the eschatological Quran. Here we are. This is what Surah? Surah to Zufruf. And it is verse 61. Are we going to spend some time with this verse now? Fa'adawuzu billahi min shaytani rajeem. Wa innahu la alamun lissa'a. Wa la tamtarunna biha. Wa tabi'uni hadha. Siratum Mustaqim. Let's get the explanation. Behold, surely he is a pronoun. Pronoun he, or it could be it. And we we say that he stands for Jesus, but we have to prove it. He is indeed the sign of all signs of the last hour. And have no doubt whatsoever about it. Rather follow what this Quran has declared. This is the straight way. This is the most important verse in the whole Quran on Akhir Zaman. Because Allah is confirming in an ayah muhkama that Jesus alayhi salam is the sign of all signs of the last hour. This is the only verse of the Quran which has made the plain, clear, and categorical declaration that Jesus is the sign par excellence of the past hour. Hence it is on the, this foundation verse of the Quran that an effort can proceed to study the role of Jesus in Islamic eschatology. Now then, the signs of the last hour cannot commence until and unless all the prophets of Allah have been sent to mankind. We understood that. The signs of the last hour cannot begin to appear in history until and unless all the prophets of Allah have been sent to mankind. So the appearance of Jesus himself cannot be a sign of the last day. The virgin birth cannot be a sign of the last day because there is still another prophet to come. And he himself told the Israelite people that he has come to convey the news wa mubashiran bi rasulin Ya'ati min ba'di smuhu Ahmad. That I have come to tell you, give you the great news, the good news of a prophet, one prophet. He didn't say prophets, he said one prophet to come after me, one. 
who will come after me and whose name is Ahmad. And uh, maybe in the question and answer session, you can ask me why his name Ahmad. <laughs> so now, the, line, the signs of the last hour cannot begin to appear in history until and unless all the prophets of Allah have been sent to mankind. So Jesus himself could not constitute such a sign of the last hour during his entire life on earth. From his miraculous virgin birth up to the day when he is raised to Allah most high. Since there is still another prophet to come. Since nothing in the life of Jesus, son of the Virgin Mary, could qualify as that sign, the question now arises, how could Jesus be the sign of the last day? That's the question. Because the Quran is saying, And he, Jesus is the sign par excellence of the last day. And we are asking, how could Jesus be the sign of the last day when there is still another prophet to come? The answer has to be tafsirul Quran, bil Quran. But you must seek to explain the Quran with the Quran before you go jumping into a taxi, speeding down the road to find some interpretation. No, first let the Quran explain the Quran. It is only when the Quran does not explain the Quran, only then, and not before, do you have the freedom now to seek to interpret the Quran. Let me repeat that. I hope you're listening to me, even if you're in Kashmir. It is only when the Quran does not explain the Quran that you now would have the freedom to seek to interpret the verse of the Quran. You cannot do it before you attempt to use the Quran to explain the Quran. So the question is, how could Jesus be a sign of the last day when there is still a prophet to come after him. It is precisely because this verse of the Quran is of such tremendous importance that we need to devote an effort to discover the status of Al Zukhruf, verse 61 on which the eschatological Qur'an is constructed. So now we have to deal with that pronoun. It could be either he or it could be it, the pronoun. So let us go to the whole passage. While the Qur'an has provided ample evidence of the mirac miraculous return of the Messiah to this world, None of that evidence is stated plainly, clearly, and categorically. All of it has to be interpreted. Rather, the divine wisdom ordained that the evidence of his miraculous return be always derived through interpretation. And whenever a verse of the Quran is interpreted by someone in one way, people must recognize the possibility it can be interpreted by others in another way. And so only Allah can confirm that an interpretation is correct. The only thing in the life of Jesus which can qualify as a sign of the last day would have to be something that happens after Nabi Muhammad but before. And the only thing in the life of Jesus 
that will occur after Nabi Muhammad has to be his miraculous return to this world more than 2,000 years after his departure. Good. So now let's turn to Surah to Zufra, verse 61. Be patient with me now. When you have to teach this subject, Tell them, be patient. This is what it says. And behold, surely he or it is indeed a sign of the last hour. It was easy to recognize by reference to context of the previous verses, that the pronoun he referred to Jesus. Now then, pay careful attention to the context. Pay careful attention and see whether the word he could refer to anything else or it. To anything else other than to Jesus? That's the question. Okay. Be careful attention now. It has been become necessary to, for us to quote the entire passage in which the pronoun occurred so that the reader might better be able to identify who it is that the pronoun represents. We have no need to interpret it, the Quran. No, it would be a simple matter of grammar and context. You will address. That's all. Now then, the Quran begins the passage, which is verse, verses 57 to 61, with a plain and clear reference to Jesus, the son of Mary, direct reference. And just so by name. Walamma Durib ibn Maryam Mathalan Iza kawmuka minhu yasidjoon And whenever the nature of the son of Maryam is set forth as a lesson, as an example O oh, Muhammad, Lo, your people raise an on, arise an outcry on this God. So now he's mentioned by name, Jesus, the son of Mary. Next verse. Readers should carefully note that when the Quran used the word he in the next verse below. It referred to Jesus. We go to the next verse now. they ask, which is better, our deities or him? The gods we tree worship or him, Jesus. But it is only in the spirit of dispute that they put this comparison between you before you. Yeah, they are a contentious folk. In the next verse, the pronoun he again clearly referred to Jesus in huwa in huwa illa abdun an amna alayhi wa ja'alnahu masala li bani israel in huwa illa abd he meaning Jesus is nothing more than a servant an amnahu an amna we bestowed on him our grace 
وجعلناه مثلا لبني اسرائيل As for him, that is Jesus. He was no more than a human being, no more than a servant of ours on whom we bestowed our grace and through whom we provided evidence of truth to Israelite people. So far, Allah is speaking about Jesus in every verse, in every verse, in every verse. Again, in the next verse below, there is a reference to Jesus. وَلَوْ نَشَاءَ لَجَعَلَّا مِنْكُمْ مَلَائِكَةً فِي الْأَرْضِ يَخْلُقُونَ And though, and if Allah is saying you rejected the miracles that we had given to Jesus, such as talking from the cradle, and he was yet a baby, and you declared it was pure, pure magic. Mm -hmm. You rejected it. But we had, had we so well, we could indeed have made you into angels succeeding one another on earth. Allah is comparing what he did to Jesus and what he could have done, mm -hmm. even though you rejected it. It is in this verse below, it is in this verse below, which declares that he is the sign of the hour. He is the sign of the last hour, that we are required to make the simple effort based on context to recognize that the pronoun he refers to Jesus. وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِسَّعَ فَلَا تَمْتَرُنَّ بِهَا وَاتَّبِعُونِ هَذَا سِرَاتٌ مُسْتَكِيمٌ And the old surely he meaning Jesus, the Lisa. He is indeed a sign of the last hour and have no doubt whatsoever about it. But follow me, this alone is the straight way. If this is so plain and clear, based on context, Tafsir al-Quran, Bil quran that Allah is saying that Jesus is the sign of the last hour. Well then, how do we explain? Hello. Our readers would agree, based on consistency in context, that the pronoun he in the above verse cannot but refer to Jesus. Hence the Quran has declared above that Jesus is the sign of the last hour. It must therefore be a matter of considerable concern that eminent scholars of the Quran should conclude otherwise. Look at this. Muhammad Asad is a very eminent scholar of the Quran of the modern age. He is given a translation and commentary of the Quran, highly respected. He was a scholar of considerable eminence. Muhammad, I had the I had the honor of meeting him once. In 1976, I was a student in Geneva, and there was a conference in London. And I wanted to give him a copy of my teacher's book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. So I flew over to London from Geneva to attend the conference. And uh, during a break in the conference, I saw him standing and I went quickly. And I was so shy to be in the presence of a great man. I just handed the book to him and didn't bother to even stop to talk with him. I was so scared. So here's, here's Muhammad Asad's translation of the verse. That he, Jesus, is indeed 
the sign of the last hour. And behold, Muhammad said, this Quran, this Quran is the means to know the last hour. This Quran is the means to know that the last hour is bound to come. And hence, I have no doubt whatsoever about it. So when the pronoun, we say the pronoun stands for Jesus, he say no. The pronoun stands for the Quran, but the context is Jesus. Why has Muhammad Assad departed from the context? Refusing to say that the Quran is saying that he, Jesus, is the sign, the alam of the last hour. Why? This is very strange because it's plain and straightforward to all of us. Muhammad Abdullah al Halim, who also made a translation and commentary of the Quran, same view as Asad. He said, This Quran gives knowledge of the hour. So the pronoun he or it, for us the he is Jesus, for them no it means the Quran. How did they come to this conclusion? Mahmudu Pixel, who must be credited with a very accurate attempt to translate the Quran. Although I hold the view the Quran cannot be translated. And he chose to ignore the one of he and it altogether. He says, verily, there is knowledge of the hour. Yes, he, he or it. <laughs> so doubt not concerning it. There has to be a reason which explains why eminent scholars of the Quran would have a wrong understanding of this verse of the Quran. And we intend to locate it. These are not the only people. There are many, many, many others. Because they translate this verse differently. They even say Jesus is dead. Jesus is not returning. One of them was the Sheikh Al-Azhar, the head of Al-Azhar University. And he gave a fatwa. Jesus is dead. Jesus is not returning. Eminent scholars, how can we explain it? As students, you have homework to do. When the Quran is giving an ayah muhkama, an ayah which is muhkama means it is in the ummul kitab. That Jesus is the sign of the last hour. And these scholars say no. The Quran is not saying Jesus is the sign of the last hour. The Quran saying that the Quran is the sign of the last hour. And well then, what is the explanation? Up to this day, we have eminent scholars of the Quran in the world today alive who declare Jesus is dead and not coming back. How can we explain when the Quran is plain and clear and it says that he, Jesus, is the sign of the last hour. And the only way, the only way that he can be a sign of the last hour is if there's something connected with him which occurs after Nabi Muhammad. And the only thing that's that is there in Jesus to have occur after Nabi Muhammad is his return. So how do we explain this? It's a big problem. Eminent, eminent, eminent scholars of the Quran alive in the world today are declaring Jesus is dead. And their scholarship is based on the Quran. How do we explain it? This is your homework for those who have a, a, a 
longing for knowledge. We have to go now to something called a skill. A skill, a uh, diacritical marks. That's a big word, diacritical marks. A skill. In the uh, in the Arabic text of the Quran. The Tashkil are the Fatha and Kesra and Dhamma, the vowels, which determine how a word is pronounced. The English language doesn't have it. <laughs> but in Arabic, a word can be pronounced in different ways based upon the vowels. So there were two reasons why when the Quran was revealed to Nabi Muhammad and when he dictated the Quran to the scribes and they wrote it down. At that time, there was no tashkil because the Arabs did not need it. The Arabs were not dependent on a written text. From the time a verse was revealed, it would be memorized. Memorized. And so there were large numbers of people who were Hafiz of the Quran. Muhammad Muslim himself is Hafiz of the Quran. Because there were not the people who used to read and write. So there were no tashkil in the Quran at that time, no marks, fatha, kesra, dhamma. These marks of fatha and kesra and dhamma were introduced later on for two reasons. Number one, this is the word of Allah. So you have to make sure that every word is pronounced correctly. Correctly. So they put in the fatha and the kesra and the dhamma in order to ensure that we pronounce each word correctly. Why? Because if you don't put it, the same, same word can be pronounced two different ways. The second reason why they put it in was because large numbers of non-Arabs were becoming Muslims. They didn't speak Arabic. The people from Iran spoke Farsi. The people from India, Pakistan, and so on spoke Hindi. The Sanskrit and so on. People from Africa spoke different African languages. And so now these are in non Arabic speaking people and to help them to recite the Quran, to read the Quran, it was necessary to put in the tashkil. Tashkil, diacritical marks, a big word, meaning the fatha and kasra and dhamma. We must not, yes. I wish I knew when it was done. I wish I knew the names of the people who did it. But we don't have that information. We must now address the subject of Tashkeen or diacritical marks in the Arabic text of the Quran, which assist us in ensuring that a word is pronounced accurately. And the same word, because the same word pronounced differently, can have completely different meanings. The early copies of the Quran had no diacritical marks, since the early Arabs did not need them. They were inserted later not only to ensure accuracy in pronunciation, but also because a very large number of non-Arabic people eventually entered the community who followed Muhammad and who needed those marks to assist them 
he recited in the Quran. Only a schoolboy would declare that the diacritical marks inserted by human beings form a part of the divinely revealed Quran and are divinely protected. They have to be a schoolboy to believe that. Because the Quran that was revealed to Muhammad had no tashkeen. The Quran which was recorded by the scribes had no tashkeen. Tashkeen came afterwards. Human being put it in. So it cannot be a part of the Quran. It cannot be a part of the Quran. Only the Quran which is divinely protected is absolutely authentic. Something which is not a part of the Quran and is not divinely protected cannot be recognized as absolutely authentic. Let us repeat that statement for the schoolboys. Only the Quran which is divinely protected is absolutely authentic. Something which is not a part of the Quran and is not divinely protected cannot be recognized as absolutely authentic. That's plain language. Now something truly mysterious occurred at a time unknown. We don't know when. When all copies of the Quran showed diacritical marks inserted in such a way as to render the word in this verse, Surah Tul, Zukruf, verse 61, wa la alamun lissar. Wa innahu la alamun lissar. This is the way. Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala, he recited the verse this way. But every single copy of the Quran I have ever seen in my long life, and you, my students, could go and search as well. How is it, how do you explain? that every single copy of the Quran today has given a different tashkil. Instead of the tashkil of Abdullah ibn Abbas, that he, Jesus, is the sign of all signs of the end of the last hour. Instead of that, we have a different tashkila, and it says, "For in the ilmun lisar, he is the knowledge of the hour." The Arabic text can be written as either, "For in the alamun lisar, he Jesus is the sign of the last hour." Or it could be written as Ainahu la il mudlisa. You just have to change it, the skill. From alam, it becomes ill. But every single copy of the Quran you could check today has only this one. And no He says, but in Nahu, the Alamun Lissa. In Nahu, the Alamun Lissa. This one is not to be found anywhere. Here. Only Abdullah. And this one, in Nahu, the Ilmun Lissa, is every.
which test scale is correct? Can they both be correct? Can Allah, can Allah send a Quran which is mobile, plain and clear? in which there is no contradictions. And one verse of the Quran can be read either as he is the sign of the last hour or he is the knowledge of the last hour. Is this possible? The first one will be an ayah, muhkama. Surely he is a sign of the last hour. That is an ayah, muhkama. Because the Quran explains, Tafsir al Quran, Bil Quran, that he is a sign of the last hour as his return is a sign of it. So it's an ayah mukka. But what about, <laughs> and he is the knowledge of the last hour. He is the knowledge of the last hour. Is this possible? Who can answer this question? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam. Sheikh is Asif from Leicester. Uh, yes, Asif. Uh, Allah Ta'ala says in a Quran, I don't remember the exact ayah, Allah says, no one knows the knowledge of the hour. Uh, Asif, just give me a minute and I'll give you all the verses on the subject. Just okay. For, just, yeah, just be, be, wait for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Who will answer this question? Is this the skill correct? The one which is in the Quran now, the printed copies of the Quran, everywhere in the world you look, you'll find this one. Or is it the one that Abdullah ibn Abbas used to recite? Which one is correct or are they both correct? <laughs> Who must answer that question? Assalamualaikum. I am Junaid from Kashmir. Yes, Junaid. <clears throat> Junaid, what's your question? Hello? Okay. Who can answer that question? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Yes, you did. Yes. Hello? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, Salam. It's Sajid from Edinburgh. Sajid from Edinburgh. Yes, Sajid. Yes, uh, Sheikh, I believe the answer lies in the grammar. Uh, no, no, I don't want attempt. you to answer us yet. <laughs> All right, okay. I'm not answering, yeah. I'm just uh, no, I, don't want to that. I will give you a chance. Okay. The question so. is, who can answer that question? Okay? And we declare that it is the Quran. The Quran must answer the question. We must not go elsewhere before we go to the Quran. We must turn to Tafsir al Quran, Bil Quran, to answer the question. Secondly, we must also accept the absolute authority of the ayat muhkamat of the Quran for solving the problem. Once the ayat muhkamat of the Quran have spoken, everybody must be silent and submit. No one can challenge that. The ayat muhkamat of the Quran have the status of ummul kitab, the heart and substance of the book. And this is what tafsir al Quran, bil Quran, gives to us on the subject of ilmul lisan, or knowledge of the last hour. There you are. This is what you wanted. Yes, Aluna Kaanisa at the Ayanam. Pulinama il Muha in the Rabbi. La Yujali Halivotiha illahu. 
ثقلت في السماوات والارض لا تاتيكم الا مغتة يسالونك كانك حفي عنها قل انما علمها عند الله ولكن اكثر الناس لا يعلمون. They will ask the O Muhammad about the last hour, the sa'a. When will it come to pass? Say to them, tell them the ilmu sa'a, the ilmu sa'a, the knowledge of the last hour is with Allah, my Lord God, and not from him alone. The knowledge of the last hour is with Allah and with Allah alone. None but he will reveal it in his time. So it has not been given to Muhammad It has not been given to Isa Islam. It has not been given to Musa Islam. It is only with Allah. The knowledge of the last hour is only with Allah. Heavily will it weigh on the heavens and the earth. And it not fall upon you otherwise. Except all of a sudden. And they will ask the, as if you could gain insight into this mystery by dintel position. Where say, knowledge rest of this subject rests with Allah alone. Most people are unaware. So, ilmusa or the knowledge of the last hour is with Allah and Allah alone. This is one verse. Surah Al Araf, verse 187. That's the first one. Okay, here's another one. Yes, yes, yes. Alukan Nas or Anisa. And they question you about the last hour. Pull in the Mahil Allah. Tell them that the knowledge of the last hour is with Allah. What will make you understand how close it is? People will ask you about the last hour. Say to them, the knowledge of the last hour is with Allah alone. Yet for all you know, the last hour may be very, very near. What verse is this? Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 63. We have two already, yeah? That the knowledge of the last hour is with Allah and him alone is not with Muhammad, not with Jesus, not with Abraham, not with Moses, with nobody. Third one. Inna Allah indahu ilmu sa'a. This is Luqman. Verse 34. Verily, with Allah alone rest the knowledge to when the last hour will come. Not with Jesus. No, no, only Allah. Surah Luqman, Surah to Luqman, verse 34. And now, Surah to Fussilat, verse 47. Ilayhi yuraddu ilmu sa'a. In him alone is vested the knowledge of when the last hour will come. This is Surah to Luqman, no, Fussilat. That's three so far? I mean, four. Four already. And now comes another one. Tabarak al-lazi lahu mulku samawati wal aldu ma baynahum. Something wrong with I don't know where they got it. Wa indahu ilmu sa'ati wa ilayhi tulfi'oon. I don't know where this, this came from. Uh, this is Surah to Zukhruf. And this is the same Surah, right? Zukhruf. But this is verse 85. Hallowed be he unto whom the dominion of the heavens and the earth and all that is in between them belongs, and with whom the knowledge of the last hour rests, and unto whom you shall all be brought back. I gave you five verses of the Quran. 
that is enough. And they all ayat mukkama. In other words, this is Ummul Kitab, the heart of the book. And the heart of the book is saying that Jesus does not have the knowledge of the last hour, and he is not the knowledge of the last hour. The knowledge of the last hour is only with Allah. It should now be clear. It should now be quite clear that the diacritical marks inserted in the second text about which resulted in the Quran declaring that he, Jesus, is the knowledge of the last hour. These are invalid. Why? Because they are in conflict. Five verses which are ayat muhkamat of the Quran. And therefore, Ummul Kitab, they're in conflict. And the Quran has declared that the knowledge of the last hour is with Allah and Allah alone. And no one can be and no one can have the knowledge of the last hour, not even Prophet Muhammad. Now then, what can it possibly mean that Jesus is the knowledge of the last hour? Not only is it in conflict, the Quran, what does it mean? How can he be the knowledge of the last hour unless he has the knowledge of the last hour? How can he have the knowledge of the last hour when that knowledge is with Allah and with Allah alone and no one else? If the verse is read as he is the knowledge of the last hour, would contradict several ayat muhkamat of the Quran. The correct pronunciation of the word with different diacritical marks would result in the verse being read that he is the sign of the last hour. Not he is the knowledge of the last hour. Can the declaration now then we now address those who say, but inna hu la ilmul lisa is not an ayah muhkama. Imam, listen carefully. Our critics will now say, no, 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 wa inna hu la ilmul lisa is not an ayah muhkama. It is an ayah mutashabiya, it has to be. Interpreted. And can the declaration that he is the knowledge of the hour, can this be interpreted to mean, for example, that his return would be a sign of the last hour? <laughs> what is our response? Because this is how they will respond. This is precisely how they will respond. Our response is that an interpretation would transform that declaration into an ayah with a shabiha, because you are now interpreting. It's no longer plain and clear. When the Quran, when this, with this tashkil, the Quran says that he is the knowledge of the hour, what it means is that, and now they interpret it, that his return will be the sign of the last day. That is, in this sense, he's the knowledge of the last hour. So they're interpreting. So now you've taken this verse and you've made it into an ayah, mutashabiha. But a verse of the Quran cannot be recognized as an ayah mutashabiha, unless and until it cannot be explained by the Quran, tafsir al Quran with the Quran. Only then, when a verse of the Quran cannot be explained by the Quran, only then do you have the freedom now 
to seek to interpret. But what is this? But this declaration, he is the knowledge of the hour. This is clearly explained by the Quran to be in manifest conflict with the Quran. Hence, it cannot be recognized as an ayah mutashah. Secondly, the verse has already been recognized as an ayah muhkama with the first tashkil. وَإِنَّهُ لَعَلَمٌ لِسَّعَةِ is an ayah muhkama. And you now give us إِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ لِسَّعَةِ as an ayah mutashabiha, which none can confirm an interpretation other than Allah. Can Allah send the Quran in such a defective way? That it is either an ayah muhkama or an ayah mutashabiha? Is it possible? A verse of the Quran is either an ayah muhkama or an ayah mutashabiha. It cannot be both. And when we recite it with the first scale of Abdullah ibn Abbas, it is clearly an ayah muhkama. So in a, in a preference between an ayah muhkama, Abdullah ibn Abbas, and an ayah mutashabiha, because if you read it as Mokkama, it is in conflict with the Quran. So now you say, no, it's an ayah mutashabiha. You, you, you abandon tafsir al Quran, bil Quran, and you make it an ayah mutashabiha. We say, no, that's false. Once it is an ayah Mokkama, then that is what will prevail. An ayah muhkama, Jesus is the sign of the last hour, is located in Ummul Kitab, and hence it is the very heart and substance of the Kitab. Hence it is quite false for it to be also recognized as an ayah mutashabiha, whose interpretation cannot be confirmed to be correct by any other than Allah who is high. Now, we can now understand why so many eminent scholars of the Quran were misguided on this subject. My own teacher of blessed memory, Honana Dr. Fazlur Rahman Ansari, in his Quranic Foundation Constructive Muslim Society. He said, the return of Jesus is only a prophecy of Prophet Muhammad. He said that the return of Jesus is only a prophecy of Prophet Muhammad. Meaning, he also accepted this bogus tashkil. The ilmul lisar. And once you accept that bogus tashkil, finish. The Quran is no longer saying plainly and clearly as an ayah muhkama that Jesus will return. Now we can understand why Muhammad Asar was, was so misguided on this subject. Because Muhammad Asar accepted the bogus tashkil. And therefore, he came to the conclusion that the Quran is not what Allah is speaking. Wa is not the Quran, not as Jesus is the Quran. Allah is speaking about the Quran. So many eminent scholars were misguided because of this bogus tashkil. And we have no hesitation whatsoever in speaking plainly and clearly as we can, so that this is recorded in our book on Judgment Day. 
that this tashki is bogus. And that the proper tashki, the correct tashki, is the one of Abdullah ibn Abbas. That inna hu the alam al-sa'ar. That he, Jesus, is the sign of all signs of the sa'ar. And whoever did this, who changed the proper tashkil and put in this new tashkil, I don't know how, he seems to be a genius because he's able to get the bogus tashkil to be in every single copy of the Quran you could ever find in the world today. Everywhere you go, the Quran that is written is saying, and you cannot find any copy of the Quran anywhere in the world which gives the correct tashkil. Who is going to explain this? Who is going to bear the cat, as it's called, and to explain how is it that every single copy of the printed Quran in the world today gives us the bogus tashkil on this ayah. And no copy of the Quran today gives us the correct tashkil. That he is the sign of the last hour. And as a consequence, so many scholars of Islam, including Sheikh al -Azhar, including Sheikh al -Azhar. When my book on the Eschatological Quran is published, you will find the names of a large list of scholars, even many alive today, who all declare Jesus is dead and is not returning. This completes uh, my analysis of that fundamental verse of Surah to Zuhra. Before we proceed, it's time for me to take a sip of coffee and answer your questions, inshallah, the comments. David from Sri Lanka, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, just a clarification on the verses 41 and 42 of Surah Fusilat, where Allah says there is no error which can enter Quran. So, in that context, uh, if you could explain this verse, uh, Ilm and Alam. Okay. David, I have a question to ask you. Yes, Sheikh. David, the Tashkil a part of the Quran? Has it entered into the Quran? Is it, or is it outside of the Quran? Answer me. It is outside of the Quran. Then fine. Then, then, then <laughs> the Quran says nothing. No evil can enter it. It's outside mm. of the Quran, isn't it? Yes, uh, but uh, what about uh, the people reciting it in the sense, not in terms of word, people from centuries reciting this way, like... I don't know for how long now. If you can find or do the research, I'll be happy to know. When did it start? And who is now responsible? Because every single copy of the Quran, anywhere you, in the world today, you said, you'll find only this one. How come we can't find even one? With the Tashkil of Abdullah ibn Abbas. How come? Who can explain that? I find this is very mysterious and worthy of great study. This is why I made it so abundantly plain and clear that I want this recorded in my book on Judgment Day when I stand before Allah. I want it to be recorded in my book that I have declared that this tashkil is bogus. And that the correct tashkil was innahu la alamun lissar. They can call me whatever names they want to call me. And the Arab expression is, the dogs can keep on barking. And the caravan moves on. Next question. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. This is Roshan from Mauritius. From Mauritius, yes. Um, it is correct that uh, the Quran is revealed in sound, so we do not need uh, the Kasra, Dhamma, and uh, Fatha 
to Rasulullah had this sound. So the Sahaba didn't need those uh, harakat on the on the hearth. That is correct. Now this ayah, um, Surah Al Zuhruf, ayah sixty one. I think the answer to this uh, question is, uh, uh, is located in in that word fattabi'uni. Fattabi'uni means follow me. So which means that Isa alayhi salam is speaking in that ayah. Isa alayhi salam is saying follow me. So the inna who according to my understanding of Arabic he's referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The who refers to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of fattabi'uni. When Isa is speaking, he's referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this okay. ayah has, he's not connected with the ayah before it. It's, okay, it's but, like, yeah. yes. Your view is different <laughs> from ours. We spend a long, long time in teaching you, explaining to you the context. We went from this verse to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth. We don't want to go back to that, all of that again. And from that context, it was plain and clear to me. The context is Jesus. Winnahu, meaning Allah is speaking about Jesus. Okay, next. Sheikh, this is uh, Hussein from India. Hussein from India, yes, please. Sheikh, uh, I have a question, not from uh, this uh, class, but uh, it, another question. No, 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 from, no, no, at this time, no, I want question okay. on this class. Yeah, we can okay. take question afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Yes, um, Amir? Hello? Amir Adams? Are you there? All right, Taha. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, I'm Taha from, from Pakistan. From Pakistan, okay. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I have uh, an observation to share. Uh, I have observed that uh, you always have, uh, you know, very precise choice of words. I have noticed that uh, sometimes you, you, you have used uh, uh, the phrase that appearance and reality are opposite to each other. And now uh, sometimes you use uh, appearance and reality are different uh, to each other. So what is uh, why you use word opposite? And uh, when do you use word yeah, difference? Yeah. Is there a difference? Yeah. They mean the same thing. They mean okay. the same thing. Yeah. Okay, okay. In the context of the river and the fire, they are opposite to each other. Mm -hmm. Different okay. from each other, but in the sense of being opposite to each other. No, no big problem there. Next one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Maryam? Asalaamu Alaikum, Sheikh. Wa Alaikum, Shalam. I'm from India. And my question India. is... Go ahead, Maryam, from India. Yes, Sheikh. Uh, to interpret the Quran, we first attain the level of Ihsan. So is there is any procedure to attain the level of Ihsan? Ishtihad. Ishtihad is independent reasoning, independent use of the rational faculty. Hmm? And yes, you can use Ishtihad for interpreting the Quran, but you must not turn to Ishtihad for interpreting the Quran unless and until you have engaged in Tafsir al Quran to the Quran. You given made an effort for the Qur'an to explain the Qur'an. Uh, what are the rules of logic <laughs> when you're using your intellect? This is a, a, a different subject. We don't have the time to take up that subject uh, this time. Yes, um, Mario? Sheikh Mohammed, uh, I'm sorry, Sheikh. Uh... Sheikh Brian, Assalamu alaikum from United States, Mario. Just a Alaikum salam from United States. Your parents are also from United States? Hello? I'm sorry, Sheikh. Yeah, no, my parents are from Peru, South, South America. From South America? 
All good. Yes. All right. Go ahead, Mario. Sure. So when it comes to, I guess, I, I don't know if you've actually answered it already, but when it comes to um, uh, in the sight of, you know, in the sight of Allah and you're reciting it the way where, where the, the skill is being mis, you know, mis, or misrepresenting that particular ayah, in, in the sight of Allah would still count towards, you know, reciting it properly or, or does it have any, you know, I guess, effect on the integrity of the recitation? The, the Quran has again and again consistently said that Allah has sent this book to people who think. If people choose to turn off, to switch off the thinking switch and to maintain a mechanical relationship with the Quran, then they will have to pay the price for having betrayed the Quran. If you turn on your thinking switch, you'll be able to recognize that the argument and the Evidence that I provided today clearly affirm that there is a correct skill and there is a bogus skill here. And if after I have made this presentation and you come to know of it and you still insist on maintaining that skill, then you'll have to answer on this Wednesday for that. I understand, Sheikh. Thank you. Okay, Akim. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Um, this is Akim uh, from US. Uh, I'm, my parents are from Bangladesh, but I had the same question as Brother Mario. Uh, the way it should be recited is La Alam. Kamunachin Akim. Alhamdulillah, good, Sheikh. Well, you didn't answer me in Bangladeshi. <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello. Your parents are from Bangladesh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was born there as well. Yeah, you were born there. So you yeah. should be speaking yeah. some Bangla. Okay. What's your <laughs> question? Do you have uh, any other question? No, it, it's the same. So we, it yeah, was question. the same. Okay, all right. Yeah. Muhammad? Muhammad from Singapore. Hello? Okay, Muhammad is not answering. Uh, the next one. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, this is Muhammad from Singapore, Sheikh. Okay, Muhammad from Singapore. Go ahead. Sheikh, my, my question is, uh, since the Quran is uh, revealed into the world of sound, as you have explained in the last class, are we correct to say that the Quran revealed into the world of sound is only divinely protected? I didn't understand the question. Should ask come help me. Repeat the question. Uh, in the last class, uh, you have mentioned that the Quran is revealed to the heart of uh, Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam and and to the world of the world of sound. So, are we correct to say that the Quran revealed into the world of sound is only divinely protected? Are we correct to say what? Uh, the Quran. Quran revealed to the world of sound is divinely protected. No, no, the Quran was not revealed okay. in the world of sound. Revealed is wahi. Okay. Wahi. The Quran was revealed as wahi to the heart of Nabi Muhammad. But it was recited to the air of Muhammad. Every month of Ramadan. I thought this was very plainly, clearly explained. Muhammad, so what's the yes, question? Uh, are we uh, correct to say that uh, the recitation revealed by the Prophet وسلم, into the air, the world of sound, is only divinely protected? I still uh, I can't hear the last bit. Your voice go down. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, Malana, he's a. Hold He's on, asking on. that. One second. One second, yeah. Is the sound divinely protected? The Quran is divinely protected, of course. The Quran, which is recited, is divinely protected. Yes. That is what the Quran says. The Quran is divinely protected. The Quran that is recorded by the scribes 
to the extent that there is no tashkil in the Quran, that Quran, that is divinely protected because the Prophet ﷺ would ask them when they, when they recorded a revelation to recite it for him. And he would then confirm that what they have written is correct, but there was no tashkil. So the written copy of the Quran is also divinely protected, also divinely protected, but there's no tashkil in it. So if some printing press now begins to print copies of the Quran differently, okay? As could happen tomorrow, I got a copy. I got a copy of the Quran presented to me by an Islamic organization in London. And while I was reciting that Quran, I, I said, what's happening here? Am I dreaming? Suddenly I realized that this Quran was different from the one that we have with us. Either there was a misprint in the print tree, which I hope is with explanation, because there can be misprints in the print tree. But once there is any misprint in the Quran by anybody, it will be immediately corrected. Immediately corrected because Allah is protecting the Quran. Yes, next, Ijaz. Hello? Okay, next. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, Salaam. Uh, sir, I, my question is not a very intelligent one, but uh, when you were uh, explaining Majmaul Bahrain and you told us that it is the it is the junction where the uh, knowledge internally received meets the knowledge which is acquired, can you please put some light on the knowledge which is externally acquired? Yes, because there the, are knowledge, the knowledge that is externally acquired is the knowledge that you acquire through observation. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ab wa khtilaf al-layli wa nahar la ayat al-layul al-alba. Surely in the nature and the constitution of the heavens and the earth and in the phenomenon of the alternation of night and of day. There are ayah, there are signs for people who think. So this is knowledge which is acquired through observation, knowledge which is acquired through rational inquiry, knowledge which is acquired through experimentation, knowledge which is acquired through the scientific method. All of this is knowledge that is externally acquired and it is necessary, Allah wants us to pursue knowledge externally acquired. And we have done that in our civilization. But in addition to that, this is the branch of knowledge called epistemology. That we say from the Quran that this is not the only means through which knowledge is acquired. The knowledge is acquired not only through observation, and experimentation, rational inquiry. But knowledge also comes internally. That Allah blesses you with knowledge directly from him. Internal knowledge. And when these two portions of knowledge are harmoniously integrated with each other, only then can you get the model of scholarship which can read and penetrate the world accurately in Akhir Zaman. And the head of that march, that methodology is Khidr al -Islam. Read the first two chapters of Dr. Muhammad Iqbal's book, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. They're very difficult chapters to read. Yes, I, sir, I tried. Yes, I, I tried reading them, but I wasn't able to get it. I had to it was read really difficult. I had to read them 20 times <laughs> to understand it when I was doing my master's degree in philosophy. 
uh, at Karachi University. But when I studied Surah al kaf of the Quran, it then became easier for me to understand what Iqbal wrote. Okay, it has. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. So, uh, Ijaz Ahmed from India. So, from Alhamdulillah, India. like today's. Yeah, mashallah, today's class, mashallah, we're getting so many bro from India. That's so good. Yes. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh, your uh, interpretation of today's class was uh, very clear and it was uh, correct uh, as well, I'm, from my understanding. So, I have a question, uh, and not with respect to today's class, a uh, uh, general question. For example, in uh, Surah 34, verse 14, the word means uh, surah? as be. Surah Saba, verse 34. Which Surah? Surah Tul Saba, 34. Surah Saba, okay, yes. Oh, in the verse 14, the word Minsa has not been uh, used or referenced elsewhere, either in the Quran or in the Hadith. So the in this case, I mean, how... Uh, it's not so it been a reference. Uh, yes, in Surah to Saba, the same uh, has not been. Uh, yeah. No, yes, we do have I it. Mean, we do have it in Surah to Tawbah. Minsa, inna man nasi uzi adatun lilkuf. Nasi, system of time. Inna man nasi uzi adatun lilkuf. The corruption of the system of time is the road that leads to endless kufr. This is surah to which surah? Tawbah. Tawbah. So we Ashaq, have but in word. the Quran's translation, it was uh, in most there of the Quran translation, they mentioned it as tough. In the Quran to the word Nasiya, I don't know. But I gave you two. And it relates to the system of time. In the word of the Minsa of Suleiman alayhi salam, whoever held on to the stuff is able to intervene in the system of time to cause time to move backward and forward. So although Suleiman alayhi salam is dead and buried, the Dajjal is holding on to the stuff and is able to deceive the angel, I'm sorry, the jinn. For the jinn are seeing Suleiman still alive, walking and talking and eating and drinking and so on, because he is able to intervene in the system of time. Because time to move back and forth. Everybody, everybody seeing that on television now. Uh, Adam? Hello? Assalamualaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Assalamualaikum uh, wa rahmatullahi wa My name is Adam. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, in the United States. And uh, you, uh, Ohio, in the United Where? States. From Ohio. Ohio. Okay. Now, United States. Um, so, um, I, I heard your explanation of the verse, Allah is the nur of the Samawat and the Ard. And I was, I gave a lot of thought to it. And going from like the creation of the angels, which is nur, and then to the, the, to the jinn, which is a smokeless flame. So I started looking up the characteristics of these things uh, from the Quran. And I found that, you know, when Allah speaks about fire, a lot of times Allah associates fire with the nature of it producing smoke. So could the smokeless flame be a verse of mutashabiyah, something that's interpreted, which is referring to electricity, especially since the, the when Dijal brought the scientific and industrial revolution, he brought into, um, he introduced mankind to electricity, particle acceleration, all these different things. So could could that be that? There is a scientist I met uh, in Islamabad, a very old man, about 80 something years of age. Went to visit him. He's a nuclear scientist. He's the one who built the Kahuta uh, atomic plant in a nuclear plant in Pakistan. 
you need a you need a man with the scientific expertise of that scholar to be able to comment uh, on the question you have. I don't have that scientific expertise. I can't help you with that yet. I, I've forgotten his name now. Uh, if you call, send me an email, uh, then I can uh, get someone uh, to give me his, his name and his contact. And then you can send an email to him. That man can certainly answer you. Next question. Hello? Yes? Hello? Yeah, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Yeah, uh, am I am I escaping someone? I think. Yeah, all right. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm from uh, Bangladesh, Sheikh. Bangladesh, my, very good. Yeah, Go ahead. Yeah, my question. My question was actually about Isa alayhi uh, salam. You you said in the class, this class, today's class, that there are some eminent scholar who are yet also even living now um, have claimed that. Uh, Isa alayhi salam is dead and he's not coming back. Uh, but uh, as we can see with our limited knowledge, that is quite clear uh, that uh, it is said ma qataluhu ma salabuhu that he is not, he not has been killed and not has been crucified. So how is that understanding coming from that scholarship? How is it we'll be dealing, yes. to we'll be dealing with this subject in subsequent classes. You just have to have a little patience, inshallah. Okay? All right, inshallah. inshallah. Next inshallah. one. Understand. Understand. Yes. Okay. Hello? Hello? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. This is uh, Tarek from Portsmouth in England. Portsmouth? Portsmouth in England, yes. Yes, yes, I visited Portsmouth once, yes. Yes, so my question is related to uh, what you mentioned about earlier when Isa alayhi salam says that he gives uh, glad tidings of Mimbat Dismu Ahmed. So I wanted your um, explanation on why Isa alayhi salam mentions the name Ahmed. Okay, <laughs> I have been uh, several lectures of mine and also in my books that are written, I've answered that question. Uh, Allah says in the Quran, for you alimuhul kitab. So Allah will teach Nabi Isa Islam the kitab, meaning the Quran. So Nabi Isa Islam knows that Allah has referred to Nabi Muhammad Islam in the Quran four times by the name Muhammad. He knows that. And yet, he does not use the name Muhammad for a prophet who is to come after him. He gives the name Ahmad. But he says that there is only one prophet to come after him. وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَعْتِ مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ I am giving you the good news of a prophet, one prophet, to come after me and whose name will be Ahmad. So there are no two or three prophets to come after him, only one. And Allah says the one prophet's name is Muhammad. And the Beast says that the one prophet's name is Ahmad. They are the same person. Don't bother about Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and his bogus faith. That's false. So why did Nabi Isa Islam not refer to him by the name Muhammad? Why does he refer to him by the name Ahmad? This is Aya Mutashabiha. The Quran, Tafsir al Quran, Bil Quran does not give you an answer. As a consequence, we now have the freedom to seek to interpret. You cannot turn to interpretation unless and until 
you made an attempt of tafsir or Quran, bil Quran. Good. So there is nothing in the Quran to help us to understand why he uses the name Ahmad when Allah uses the name Muhammad. We now interpret. And when we interpret, of course, no need for any boxing gloves because only Allah can confirm that an interpretation is correct. And my interpretation, and Allah knows best, is that this is a sign of great, intense love. That when you have tremendous love for someone, you, you never address them by their name. You give them a, a special, special love name. Uh, in French, they call it nom de l'amour, nom d'amour. And so, uh, Instead of saying Muhammad, he says Ahmad as a sign of his love for him. And even when Nabi Isa returns and comes to this world, again he will never refer to him by the name Muhammad. <laughs> he refer to him by the name Ahmad. And when you ask him why, this I believe is the answer that he will give. Next question. So, so, yes, Mujahid, is this Mujahid from London? Yes, Salaam Alaikum, Sheikh. How are you doing? Alaikum, Salaam. How are you, Mujahid? Alhamdulillah, good to hear from you. Um, you. My question is um, related to, it's not related to the topic, so if you want me to skip, I can wait until the end if you have time. Is that okay? No, no, no. Should I go ahead? Go ahead. Okay, so it's related to the chrono chronological order of the surahs in the Quran. I wanted to ask, uh, do you think there is a correlation between the events that are to unfold in Akhiru Zaman and the chron chronological order of the surahs in the Quran? I would advise you to go to my teacher's book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. In volume one of the book, he gives his views on the significance and the important, the abiding importance of the chronological sequence of the revelation of the Quran and how it is to be uh, studied in addition to the sequence in which the verses are now arranged as surahs. Uh, would you kindly go to that book? I believe you already have a copy. Yes, I have the copy, inshallah. I'll check it out. So go to that book and you'll see what he has to say on the subject. Okay, no next. Problem. Hello? Hello? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Hello. 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 Sheikh, salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Muhammad from Morocco. Muhammad from Morocco, mashallah. How are you? Yeah, fine. Uh, thank you. Really, it's a great honor. I follow your lectures from 2012, uh, since 12 years now. and. Uh, uh, I find uh, today's lesson very, very uh, challenging. Uh, I know. Uh, lecture, very good... Yes, yes, it's very challenging for you. Yes. So you must, because... allow, you must chew the food, chew the food a lot more this time. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I understand Arabic very well because I am Arab and uh, I find it very challenging in the way that. Uh, here is my question. Uh, when we say in the Arabic, uh, 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 we can say in Arabic or for example or for example and therefore the the, the who, who who can refer to uh, to mutakamil or tafsir al and in, in our context, we can say, 
and the, the who can refer to ilmun lisa'a. So in Arabic, it can be just. And Muhammad, uh, Muhammad yes, we, I, spent, we spent a long time with about six or seven ayat of Surah Al-Zukhruf to show very, very plainly and clearly the context in which the pronoun is occurring. That this pronoun who cannot refer to any other than Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi And we said the reason why men like Muhammad Asad, men like uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Mahmoud Shaltut, Al Azhar University, uh, other eminent scholars, the reason why they chose to give the meaning of the pronoun who to the Quran rather than to Jesus, Nabi Isa was because they read the verse with the bogus tashkil. Uh, and they could not stomach. Could be an ayah of Kama. Because it is in conflict with the Quran. And that is why they stayed with the ayah study. They stayed with the Tashkil. They did not challenge the Tashkil. But they rejected the view that it could refer to Jesus because that would have been in conflict with all the other verses of the Quran. That yes. is something that we explained clearly to you. But otherwise, the pronoun can have different meanings. Yes, as you pointed out. But in this context of Surah to, Surah to Zufra, the pronoun is very plainly and clearly referring to Jesus. Yeah. Yes, Sheikh, I agree with you very well because when we take the context from the Ayah uh, 58 to the Ayah 66, we are talking about Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. So you are, right. you, uh, your, ex your explanation is right. And we can say, Wa innahu la alamun lisa'a. So I, I agree with you fully. Uh, but when we take the context of the Surah, Surah Zukhruf, we find in Ayah 85, we have uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, So that's, what, that's why I, I said it's very challenging for me, uh, from an Arabic yes. point of view. Well, take a little time. I quoted this ayah 85. I quoted this, okay? In the five ayat, I gave all ayat of command. That the ilm is only with Allah. No one is. Not even Muhammad is not the son. So once you take وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ اللِّسَاءِ سَنَعَيَا مُحْكَمَا It is in manifest conflict with the Quran. So in order to get out of that situation, our critics are now saying, no, no, it's not an ayah muhkama. It is ayah mutashabiyah. We are allowed to interpret it. And then they say إِنَّهُ لَعِلْمُ اللِّسَاءِ actually means that he, his return is a sign of the last hour. But I've, I've said, no, you cannot turn to make a verse of the Quran, I am Mutashabiha, unless and until you first use a Tafsir al Quran, Bil Quran. When, the, when you go to Tafsir al Quran, Bil Quran, and the Quran does not answer you, only then. Can you make it an area with a But when we go with when we go to Tafsir al Quran, Bil Quran, the Quran is very plain and very clear that this is in conflict with the Quran. Okay, next question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Yes, uh, my question uh, had been taken, but uh, I just want to. Uh, I just remember that also we have the ayah which is mutashabiha. Uh, uh, it, it said, Right. Yes. 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 
Yeah. Where the Tashkil, one Tashkil says, to Kalimuhum, the Dabatul. Sorry, I have to laugh. <laughs> My apologies. One, one Tashkil <laughs> tells us that Dabatul Art is going to speak and speak and speak to mankind. To Kalimuhum. But if you use the correct skill, it says, but the Dabatul Al Chaklimuhum. The Dabatul Al will cause injury to you, to mankind. Injury. And that same Dabatul Al is at work with the, the staff of Suleiman al Islam to destroy the Minsa of the staff. The minsa of the staff is that which allows the one who is holding the staff to intervene in the system of time. The system of time. And Allah warns you, if you enter into the system of time to corrupt it, that is the road to ever-increasing kufr. Innam al ziyadatun lil kufr. So, what it is that can destroy the capacity of the staff to the, the minsa of the staff, that capacity of the staff to intervene in the system of time. So the one who is holding the staff can deceive the jinn to believe that the Suleiman is still alive. Because they can see Suleiman walking and talking and moving, even though he's dead and buried. I can, my explanation, of course, I can be wrong, because I'm giving an, a, a wheel, an interpretation, is that Dabatul Ad has to be something which injures, which destroys rather than speaks. And I have suggested it could be the electro magnetic waves which are now inundating all of mankind wherever we are, except in the remote countryside. They started with 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, and it destroys, it damages the memory. And if you look at children around the world today, living in the cities, becoming increasingly difficult for them to memorize the Quran. The halfways of the Quran for tomorrow will come only from the remote countryside because the memory is being damaged. Next question. Hello? Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I am Sarvat from India and I want to... Hello? Hello? Hello. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. I am Junaid from Kashmir. So, Ashana, Kashmir. Uh, happy to have Kashmir. Go ahead. Uh, my question is regarding your explanation of the Ayah 61 of Surah Al Zukhruf. The majority of scholars have translated the verse as Nabi Isa as the sign of Qiyamah, even though the word ilm, ilm has been used in the words, as you said. Now, coming to tafsir of the words, majority of the scholars have accepted that this indeed refers to Hadrat Isa as the sign. But a group of those scholars say that this refers to miraculous birth of Hadrat Isa, the miracles that he produced, like raising dead to life, etc. They say that if we accept it, that this refers to the nuzul of uh, Nabi Isa in the end times, and then the ayah after this, that is uh, verse 62, doesn't allow that. Uh, Nabi already, Isa, I've already spoken on this subject earlier in this class today. He, I have said to you, nothing, nothing in the life of Nabi Isa al-Islam can const be constituted as a sign of the last day when there is still a prophet to come. A last prophet has not as yet come. It is only after that last prophet has come, only then can the signs of the last day commence. 
and therefore the virgin birth of Nabi Isa Islam cannot constitute a sign of the last day. All right? Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Saad, go ahead. There was someone from Egypt and he's gone. Where is he? No, uh, I'm here, Sheikh. You are there. Please remain. Don't leave. Go ahead. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Sheikh. Go ahead. Wa alaikum salam. Oh, I wish you could come back to Egypt someday. Yes, I loved, I loved Egypt. I lived for one year in Egypt when I was just 22 years of age. I was living in the um, Mashal Jadida in Heliopolis. <laughs> I wish you were. I wish we had more scholars like you, Sheikh. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I love my stay in Egypt, but now it's not possible for me to return to Egypt because. Uh, well, let me yes. not mention. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, yes, I know. Without uh, you having to say anything. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. My question is about uh, Basira and Khidr. Uh, Basira I've heard and you, Khidr. Yes, I've heard uh, your lectures uh, uh, speaking um, about uh, Noor and uh, the verses in Surah An Noor and uh, the explanation of uh, all of this. So the people who do not have this Basira or Noor this is uh, part of the fitna of the Dajjal. Uh, I mean, the 99% of Ahli Juj Ma'ujuj. Who are they exactly? The people who don't have Basira, who don't know the reality of today's world, or who are these people exactly? First of all, I quoted the verse, that Allah gives his light to whomsoever he chooses. Yes. But there's another verse in which Allah is more explicit. This is Allah's fadl, Allah's grace, Allah's gift. And he gives it to whomsoever he chooses. So there's no book that you can read. There's no university course that you can attend to get noor from Allah. Getting the noor from Allah requires the heart. It must be salim. Illa man atallaha bi qalbin salim. La yamassu illa al mutahharun. Wa'alamu anna allaha yakulu bain al mari wa qalbi. Allah is watching the heart. If the heart is sincere, if the heart has purity in it, if the heart is adhering firmly to truth, regardless of the price you have to pay. Most of mankind today are not like that. They are like sheep and cattle. There are ways, but they don't hear. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have hearts, they don't understand. Hmm? These people are blind. Most people are like that today. Blind, deaf, dumb, because they lack the sincerity in their heart to stand firmly for the truth regardless of the price they have to pay. Look at Ibrahim al-Islam. He's just a boy. He's not yet a full-grown man. He's just a boy. And he goes into the temple and he smashes all the idols and leaves the big one there. And what they did, they built a fire and they threw him in the fire to burn him alive. This kind of courage in the heart of Ibrahim <laughs> he didn't care this is sincerity and the, the people who are truly followers of the one religion of Islam are people who have that kind of dedication in their hearts and sincerity to truth Egypt is suffering today because there are those in Egypt who will not submit, they want to remain firmly to the truth 
and may Allah make them strong. Next question. Uh, hello, Assalamu Alaikum. My name is Hewat Saad from Afghanistan and speaking now from Germany. From Afghanistan, uh, okay. My question is that uh, there is a verse in the Quran which says that we have sent down this Quran and we are its protectors. So Allah has sent down the Quran as a sound. As you said, he, he nuzzled the Quran as a sound and not as a texture. And later on, uh, we uh, wrote the Quran and to deliver it to other people. So my question is that, is that verse which says that we have delivered you the sound and we are its protectors, is that not in conflict with this ayah that today we have studied? Uh, because we are reciting this ayah, uh, we are standing behind the imams and they are reciting this ayah in, in, in the way which it is. Uh, uh, so the sound that we have today is, is it not the same sound that Allah has sent down? And if it is not the same sound, then did Allah not protect it? If we had a, a tape recording of the Quran being recited by the companions of the Prophet, we could benefit from it today. But we don't have a tape recording. And the only thing that we have to hold on to, we thank Allah for it, is the evidence that Abdullah ibn Abbas recited the verses in Nahu la alamun lisa. And we asked if Abdullah ibn Abbas recited the verses like, is it not mysterious? Will you not think? How do we explain that every single copy of the Quran, anywhere in the world you pick it up today, any copy of the Quran, all says, this different skill. The inna huda ilmulisa. That is mysterious. And I've given you abundant evidence today. This tashkil is not a part of the Quran. So when Allah says, uh, is the ayah, inna nahnu nazal nazik. Inna nahnu Nazal Nazikr. That is three. First person plural, eh? You know. Inna Nahnu Nazal Nazik. Yeah, first person plural three times. We are the ones who send down this guitar, the zikr, and we are going to protect it. And here you have the evidence that it's been protected. Because what I've done in this class to point out that this bogus tashkil is there. And we must get away from this bogus tashkil and recite the Quran the correct way. We don't know who put in the tashkil, but this tashkil is not a part of it. Next question. Um, we have to take only one, one or two more because time is running up. There's someone from Trinidad, Riyad from Trinidad. Uh, who wants me to recommend a translation of the Quran in English? I use Muhammad Asad, despite the fact that Muhammad Asad has made some mountains of mistakes. But never mind, she still remains. If you correct the mistakes in Muhammad Asad, he's one of the best in English so far. Okay, another one. Hello? Hello? Assalamu alaikum. It's me, Muhammad Ali from Sweden. Yes, Muhammad uh, Ali, the Yemeni from Sweden. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Remember me, Sheikh. I yes, really want to see. You came to see me in Armenia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just want to mention that uh, Jazakallah Khair for all you've done until today. Every day I listen to you, I get more and more knowledge, mashallah. Uh, and my question is uh, about uh, eschatology itself. Many asked me, and it's been this question is every day asking, many asking this question, what is the benefit of eschatology? 
can you give us uh, the benefit the benefit I started the class Muhammad I started the class with the event English Nabi Muhammad is in the masjid with his companions and this is after the Fat Makkah they after the Hajj and he returned to Makkah and Medina and there are just 81 days left in his life. And then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibra'il alayhislam and he came into the masjid in front of everybody in the form of a human being. This is the first and only time in human history, the first and the only time in human history that the angel Gabriel came as a human being before a large gathering of people. And he asked five questions. And the Prophet answered them. And when we look at the five questions, we see that they are related to eschatology. When will the last hour come? What are the alamat al and the first three questions are the methodology. You can't answer these questions. You cannot penetrate Akhiru Zaman unless you have first Islam. And Islam rises to Iman. And after Iman, there is an Ihsan and Ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tarahu bi bi'aynil qalb. That you should be able to see Allah with the internal eye, because you can't see him with these eyes. Lantarani. This internal eye is Basar. So in order to be able to read the world in Akhir Zaman, you need Basar. Here is the importance of eschatology in the visit of the angel Jibra'il al Islam and in the five questions. Okay, thank you, Muhammad. We, now, uh, we have time for one more question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Uh, I'm Naif right. from Saudi Arabia. You, you're talking from Saudi Arabia. Go ahead. Yes, sir. So I have a question uh, from your lecture. Uh, how, to un how to understand the Zionists who use the Bible and the Torah and also how to uh, make our men uh, how to let our men get uh, evolved? How to face the Zionists and how to make our men get more developed? Yes, I have spent my entire life. <laughs> I have spent my entire life going to the Quran, using the Quran to be able to respond to what the Zionists are doing. I suggest a knife uh, that you, uh, if your English is good enough, I see you speaking English, that you can get all my books. Um, I have about 31 books now, many of them are on uh, the Quran and the end time. Uh, we also have them, many of them in Arabic, but they're not published. I send them to you by email in Arabic. I have my student Mahir uh, in Yemen. And he is in charge of all the Arabic uh, translations. So I suggest to you, Naib, that you read my books, you study them, and they will help you in understanding how you can use the Quran to respond to the challenges posed by the Zionists. Okay, uh, one more question, Yasmin. Hello? Okay, what is the Tashkeel of Alam? Contain the whole course of the future unfolding events. Are we allowed to fix it? Or <laughs> or <laughs> Naive, okay. Um, yes, Yasmin? Hello? 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 
okay. Well, no, no Yasmin, so we have no answer. Uh, until next week, inshallah. Today we have a very long question and answer session. Uh, until next week, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you. 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 Thank you.